Uh, first, we have an announcement. Hi, I just wanted to invite everybody to um, Women in Computing Computing's Bowling Social. It's on Monday at 4.30 to 6.30 at the bowling alleys in the Union. So just come and bowl for free and eat pizza. Just want to invite everybody. Okay, so it's midterm week. Midterm is Thursday. Uh, what? Oh. Oh. I thought I made a mistake. Okay, it's a, the midterm is on Thursday, and uh, no assignment due this week. Next assignment will be due. Uh, the, actually, the assignment's out. PS7 is out. It's due a week from Thursday. Uh, any questions about anything? Any problems? Issues? Yes? So in the midst of the practice, will that also be given to us? Yeah, I'll, I'll put the master theorem on the exam, so you don't have to put that on your um, note sheet. Yes? Okay, so you're asking about, the, we did the amortized analysis of the array list. And uh, the way I described the result was that you could do k add last <coughs> operations in O of k time. And you're asking how we did that? Well, it depends on how, how deep, at what level of detail you want to know how we did that. But we, um, what we did was we looked at uh, doing k operations and we added up the cost of every operation. We, uh, we assumed that we used two constants. I don't remember exactly which ones, A and R. And uh, do you have the formula we came up with there at the end? I think A plus 2R. A plus 2R. Minus R. Right, and we ignored the, that thing, the, the, the minus part, because it was small. So that was the average, <coughs> that was the average amount of effort per insertion. That A plus two R. So how does that of K? It's O of, it's O of K to do K insertions, to, to do K operations. So each operation has an average time that's constant. Okay? But 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 some of the operations, it's so we could just say on average it takes constant time. Uh, what I chose to do instead was, instead of talking about the average time for one operation, I talked about the worst case time for k consecutive operations, which is just k times that constant divided by k. So, I mean, it's just take k times that constant, I mean. So it's a, a way to talk about a really, a really the worst case for k insertions instead of the average case for one. Okay, so... Uh, I have a lot of things I could do. I want to start by just talking about what's going to be on the, you know, what the exam's going to cover and sort of an outline of what we've talked about. Then we have the sample midterm that I gave you to look at. and also have another sample midterm we can look at. So let's start with this. Okay, so midterm's Thursday. You can bring a sheet of notes. Uh, the exam will cover the first six weeks of lecture, plus there was a little bit about graphs that leaked over to week seven. It will cover chapters zero through four of the book, except we didn't do, we barely did anything in chapter one. And we didn't do uh, the last two sections of chapter two. But everything else we pretty much covered from the book. Uh, through chapter four. Uh, the review slides tell you what's covered, and it'll also cover what we did on PS1 through PS6. Uh, these are the major topics we did. We started with uh, a review in the form of talking about <coughs> complexity analysis, both experimental and asymptotic analysis. Uh, we talked about basic algorithms that you learned in 2420 and basic data structures from 2420. So those, those three topics were sort of a review we did in the first couple weeks. Uh, then we moved to chapter 
two of the book and talked about divide and conquer algorithms. We looked, looked, at, looked at examples and, uh, and used the master theorem, among other things. Uh, there were two chapters on graphs. Graph decomposition is the term, is the chapter where we talked about a depth first search and its applications. A graph search is where we talked about breadth first search and shortest paths algorithms. And then we touched on modular arithmetic briefly. So here, here are topics for complexity analysis. So, you know, I can stand here and read the topics to you. It, it'll work better as a review if you ask me questions that occur to you when you see these topics. So um, please ask if you have questions. Um, maybe I'll ask you questions. Why do we do asymptotic analysis? Basically, why are we satisfied with just figuring out the high order term. Yeah? Because that's all that matters when n grows large. Okay, so he said that's all that matters when n grows large. Um, is that all that matters? If you have an algorithm that's uh, 2 n squared and another that's n squared, isn't it good to be twice as fast even when n is large? Why do we throw away the leading constant? Yeah? Well, sure, when, well, we, for, we really don't care about, if things happen really fast, it doesn't matter what algorithm we're using, but for large data sets, for large sizes, um, if I have an algorithm that takes two n squared seconds and another that takes n squared seconds, which would you prefer? Wouldn't you like one that's twice as fast? Absolutely you would. Why do we throw away the, low, the um, linear constants? Yeah. Um, it, it tells us kind of how the algorithm will scale because uh, the doubling behavior, um, okay. when the doubling behavior is smaller, then if you need to increase the reduction size, then you'll know what its behavior will be as, as you get. Sure. You know, by just knowing the high order term without, and forget about the leading constant, it tells you how the, how the algorithm scales. That's true enough. And, you know, what's going to happen is going to tell you about the doubling behavior. But what about, don't we care that one algorithm is twice as fast as another? Yeah. My best assumption would be that we, we really care about a worst case scenario and what to expect versus the range of numbers. Like if we're going to do something with a uh, lower terms, like if the n is never going to surpass 100, it probably doesn't matter exactly how specific we get as long as we don't double it too heavily. But if we do something that we know is going to be really big, like encryption keys that are going to last for like millions of numbers, probably that means it's only, does it only matter exactly how big we're expecting it to double. Okay. So I'm getting a lot of rationales, but uh, we're sort of dancing around the issue. Does anyone disagree that you'd rather have a program that's twice as fast as another? Isn't a sorting algorithm that's twice as fast as another a better one to have? So why are we happy to ignore leading constants? Because that's when we, when we ignore leading constants, we can't make those distinctions. Yeah? Different computers and Right. It's just, or to put it another way, it's just too hard to come by those leading constants. If I want to, you know, to, to say some algorithm is twice as fast to another, I've got to, I've got to talk about, to get, it, to get the leading constant refer to, to refer to time, I've got to talk about what language am I using, what compiler am I using, what, per, what uh, um, computer am I, am I using. And uh, that's where it gets too complicated to figure out exactly what these high order terms are, what, these, what the leading constants are. It's just, uh, it's, it's too sensitive to the technology that we're using. And the answer that you get today may be different than the answer than you get next week or next year or two years from now. But, you know, the, the, if you try to figure out, you know, quicksort was invented around 1960. So if you tried to figure out uh, in terms of seconds how fast quicksort was in 1960, the answer today would be just you know, completely different because computers are so much faster. 
languages are so much better. So we don't play that game. It's just too hard to, to pin it all down. Uh, now, if you're making a decision for a particular situation, and you have a computer picked out in a language, then you can time things and figure out which is faster and use it. But for discussing algorithms in general, higher terms the best we can do. Okay? Uh, and if you just, if, just by looking at the higher term, you can understand the doubling behavior of, per, of uh, algorithms. What happens when the size of the input doubles? And you need to be familiar with, you know, with those patterns, such as the input size doubles, the running, side running time quadruples. What kind of algorithm are you looking at? What's the complexity of that algorithm? It's n squared. Okay? If it, you double the size and the running time increases by a constant each time you double it by the same constant, what do you got? That's the login. So that, that just that stuff needs to be at your fingertips. Um, we talked about experimental complexity analysis. Didn't do a lot with it. You do a lot more of it in 2420. But in principle, it's 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 possible to test test algorithms to find out empirically how long they're going to take to run. Um, when doing asymptotic analysis, we often had to do summations to analyze loops. Yeah. Uh, back to the doubling behavior, mm -hmm. will there be like a difference between linear and linear logarithmic? Because weren't they approximately yeah. the same? Yeah, so when I ask that question, I typically don't force you to distinguish between linear and, and log n because they don't look much different when you look at the numbers. Yeah? Oh no, Karasuba has a definite doubling behavior. It triples. Uh, and you can derive it. Okay, what's the what's the complexity of Karatsuba? Log base two or three, right? Okay. So let's figure out the doubling behavior of Karatsuba. And okay, how would we do that? Okay, we would take, basically we would do, we would compare 2n to the log base 2 of 3 and divide it by n <coughs> to the log base 2 of 3. So we just compute the ratio if you double n. And how does that simplify? What can we do about this 2n raised to a power? Yeah, so we can say 2 to the log base 2 of 3, n to the log base 2 of 3, divided by n to the log base 2 of 3. That cancels out, and you're just left with 2 to the log base 2 of 3. Raising to an exponent is an inverse of taking a log to a base, so that just cancels out, and that's 3. So if, if what you remembered is, did you say 1.79 was the approximation? I don't remember the approximation. Then you're gonna have a hard time coming up on the fly with the, the doubling behavior. But if you just leave it symbolic, uh, the doubling behavior is easy to come by. Yeah? Can you do an example of amortized analysis? We, we can, I mean it, I'm worried it would take, a lo take too long. Yeah, I'd rather not uh, do a detailed amortized analysis because it does take a while. Yeah? Could you give us some pointers on uh, comparing algorithmic complexity between things that have like a polynomial and a log but a, less, a degree less than one? So like square root of n, log n. Okay. So the thing to remember is we, um, you, you can make a chart uh, from, from larger complexities to lower complexities. So if you have a constant raised to an nth power, that's exponential. We often see constants of two or three, but anyway, that's exponential. 
And that is always a higher order term than any polynomial. And, and it doesn't matter. There are some requirements, like the constant right here has to be greater than 1. But like, you know, 1.0000000001 to the nth still grows faster than uh, than that in the long run. It might take a while to catch up. But this exponential to a tiny base grows faster than this polynomial to a gigantic exponent. So that's just, you just have to know exponentials always grow faster than polynomials as long as that base isn't greater, isn't, isn't, is greater than one. Okay? Then there are logs. You take any log and raise it to any power. Actually, yeah. Um, that's logarithmic. Polynomials grow faster than logarithmics, again, regardless of the, you know, you could have a, a, a tiny exponent up here, and still the, the uh, polynomial is eventually going to catch up. And then you have constants. And any log grows faster than any constant. Like, just a constant would be like C there. So that's th the first thing. So, you know, if I ask you to compare, if something's a pure exponential and something's a pure polynomial, <laughs> you know the exponential grows fast. Okay? So what's left? I'm trying to decide what grows faster. Yeah? Okay. If you compare two exponentials, like 2 to the n and 3 to the n, then it depends on if the exponent has to be <coughs> at the same n, you just compare the bases. 3 to the n grows faster than 2 to the n. Okay, so it have, has 3 to the n and 8 to the n halves. So you need to make those exponents the same. Okay, so how do we do that? How do we make the exponents comparable? I mean, isn't this... This is 3 to the n and the square root of 8 to the nth, right? So which is better, 3 or the square root of 8? Which is bigger, 3 or the square root of 8? 3. Yeah? Are we going to allow the calculator? No, no calculators. So is that unfair that I don't let you take the square root of 8? It's easy to say 3 squared is bigger than 8. Rather than taking the square root of 8, just square those sides. You see 9 is bigger than 8, so 3 is bigger than the square root of 8. Yeah? Um, this is definitely easier, but could you also take the log of both sides and not the log and then move the exponents with that? Maybe it wouldn't help, but... Um, well, let's see what happened if you took the log of both sides, of 2 to the n and 3 to the n. So you would get n log 2 and n log 3, right? You took the log of both sides. So how do those two compare? Does one grow faster than the other? Yes or no? What, does, does n log 2, n log 3, how do they compare in terms of asymptotic rate of growth? Yeah? Aren't log 2 and log 3 essentially constants? Yeah, log 2 and log 3 are constants. That's just a constant times n. Those grow at the same rate. That's not to say one is bigger than the other, but they grow at the same rate. They have the same doubling behavior. They have the same higher order term. So, yeah, taking logs won't work there. Another thing is... Um, it's true that 2 to the n grows more slowly than 3 to the n, but what about log 2 of n compared to log base 3 of n? Does the same reasoning apply there? 
In this case, you would think that the smaller the base, the faster it grows. But in fact, no, it doesn't matter the base. The logs grow at the same rate. They have the same doubling behavior. That's why we don't worry. We don't really worry about what base we're working on when we talk about logs. We do worry what base we're talking about when we're talking about exponentials because they matter. Base of the log doesn't matter as long as you're not talking about something like this to, to the log n up here. Okay, if, if the log makes it up to an exponent, then the base suddenly matters because it's in an exponent, not a base. Not in a, uh, once it gets an exponent, the, the worry changes. Okay, any other questions about these things? Yeah, you got two. I'll start there. Yeah. Yeah, factorial grows any f even faster than than that than exponentials. Yep. Oh, let me start over there. You have the next okay. question. So there was one on the exam. It was like end of the two thirds compared to square root of n log n something. Okay, n to the two thirds compared with what? Square root of n log n, okay. So how do you approach this? Log n is exponent? Hmm? Is log n the exponent? No, log n is not an exponent. Let me make one more room here. So we're looking at n to the 2 thirds and the square root of n log n. Okay, how would you go about doing that? Yeah. Well, square root of n would be n to the one half. Right, so it's, it's nice to write, write them in a form that makes them look similar. So we'll write this n to the one half. Log, log n. No, log n is not a constant. Yeah? Well, I think what I want to do is make, I want to make this thing have a term, I want to have an end of the one half term in it. Okay? So let's rewrite n to the two thirds. <coughs> That's going to be n to the one half times what? Times n to the one sixth. So if we compare n to the one half times one to the n sixth by n to the one half times log n, okay, we 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 discussed this rule that basically says, all right, it didn't say this exactly, but essentially those guys cancel out in terms of if we're trying to do this comparison, and then you just look at what's left. So what grows faster? N to the one sixth or log of n? N to the one sixth, because that's a polynomial. A polynomial always grows faster than a log of n. That's the th same thing that lets you decide that n squared grows faster than n log n. You basically say that's n times n compared to n times log n. The first two parts are the same, so we look at the second part. Yeah? It was another example in the midterm. It was um, n log n versus log n factorial. Yep. n log n and log of n factorial. Okay. All right. So that just requires a little specialized knowledge. Where did we talk about the log of n factorial? When we were talking about decision trees, we were trying to prove the lower bound on, on, uh, on the worst case of all comparison-based sorting algorithms. Along the way, we had to, you know, we knew there were n factorial leaves in a decision tree. We need to figure out the minimum depth of such a tree. So we need to take the log of n factorial. And we derived the fact that log of n factorial is theta of n log n. In fact, that's where the n log n lower bound comes from, is from that proof. So log of n factorial grows at the same rate as n log n. I mean, just to add, that's nothing I would expect you to derive during the test. It's just something that I expect you to remember from our discussion of decision trees. Yeah? I was just saying, wouldn't it be n to the two thirds is n to the one half times n to the four thirds? No, when you. 
Yeah, when you, when you multiply, you add the exponents, right? Yeah. You're thinking of stacking exponents. That's when you multiply them. Okay, other questions about this topic here? All right. Um, all right, using summations to analyze loops. So, you know, when you're analyzing programs with nested loops and trying to figure out how many times does the inner loop run, you end up often having to add things up. And there's really two facts that are good to have memorized. The first is the sum of the first n integers, which is what? It's just n times n plus 1 over 2. And the other is the sum of the first k powers of 2. So there we have 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 8 and so on. What's that? It's, it's, one, it's, it's the next power of 2 minus 1. So every, every single time we did a summation, it came down to, well, honest, I guess there was one time on assignment you had to do it, some of the first k powers of 3. So 99% of the time it comes down to using these rules in some form good things to either just have memorized or on your notes. Okay, and then we use recurrence relations to analyze recursion. And there are two types of questions I like to ask. One is just, um, here's a recurrence relation. Use the master theorem to solve it. And the other is, here is a uh, program. Write the recurrence relation for it. And I think students have more trouble with the second thing than the first thing. Just be sure that you're good at both. And then these uh, asymptotic notations at the bottom. Uh, we've used big O, omega, and theta a lot. Um, I don't expect I'll ask anything about little o and little omega. They're good to know, but... They don't occur nearly as often. But any questions about any anything on here before I go to the next slide? Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't. You don't need to worry about the low, the low omega. Yeah. Okay, let's go. Um, remember about where it was? Oh, right there. Okay. Okay. So we're supposed to figure out what f of 3k returns. Right? So someone tell me how you approach it. You know how to do it. Okay. So if we look at what I meant to do. Okay, the, th the thing to realize is, um, you know, the outer loop runs, and then the inner loop is just counting uh, from i up to, up to n. So let's first figure out what the sequence of i's are. So what, what values does i take on as this thing is running? Okay, we get 0, 3, 6, up to 3k. Okay? So when, then we look at the inner loop. So when i is 0, how many, how many things do we add to total? So the, the, it, you know, it counts from i till j is less than n. So if i starts at 0, we go up to less than n. 
That's going to be 3K. Okay, how many are done in the next iteration for I? I, I has gone up to 3, and so we're not, you know, it, we're, it's 3K minus 3. And how many is done on the last one? Last one, yeah. So the last one, I is going to be. Oh, I got this wrong here. Why is the last I 3K minus 3, not 3K? It's because of this less than right here. So the last one, we're going to be at 3K minus 3, and we're going to count up to less than N, so that's going to be. Three. Okay, did I get that right? So I, f I figured out first how many, what each value of i was going to be, and then what that meant about as we counted the, as we uh, each time through j is going to go through three k values on the first time through the loop. Each time after that, it's going to go through three fewer values, until the last time it only counts through three values. Okay, now what do we do to get the value, final value of total? Right. We've got to sum this up. Well, that doesn't look like any series that I told you to learn. So what do we do? We factor out the 3, and we get 3 times k plus k minus 1 plus k minus 2 to 1. And that's just the sum of the first k integers written backwards. So that's 3 times k times k plus 1 over 2, if I didn't make a mistake. Or 3 half k squares plus 3 half k or something. Did I get the right answer? Any questions about that? Which, which one? The first 3k minus 3, how did we find out minus 3 Okay, so originally I wrote 3k because I say we're counting from 0 up to n, but we're not counting all the way to n. I has to be less than n. And so uh, we'll get to, we'll get to uh, 3k minus 3, but then when we add 3 to it to get n, we will stop. Yeah? So we're not really taking into account, it says what does f 3 times k return? We're not not care about the coefficient three there? It seems that we just... Oh, I was figuring out what the final value of total was. Oh. See, basically, each time through this iterative loop, we add one to total. So basically, I've just got to figure out how many values does j go through each time through the other loop. So the first time, j takes on 3k values. The next time, it takes on 3k minus 3 values. And the last time, it takes on 3. And for each value it takes on, we add one to total. Yeah. Uh, I was asking what does f of k return is, just replace all the three k's with k. You're okay. You're saying find out what f of three k returns be what? I was saying if it was asking what does f of k return, oh. just replace all. Yeah, it, it gets a little bit. The reason I say three k is because the math works out very simply as long as the number is a multiple of three. Numbers not a multiple of three, then it, you have to think really hard about what the last value is. But yeah, I mean that's essentially what you do. But I, I did this to make it probably easier, not harder. Okay, anything else? Okay. All right, basic algorithms. You should know that searching in, you know, you should know about linear search and binary search. Uh, sorting, we've talked about selection, sort, insertion, sort, fix, sort, and merge, sort. Various forms. Um, basic data structures. Uh, we talked about lists, and we talked about two ways of representing lists. One is a dynamic array, such as an array list. That's where the amortized analysis came in. And the other was linked lists. 
Uh, we talked about sets, where the technologies are balanced binary search trees versus hash tables, and similarly for maps. And you should understand the trade-offs between them. What's the trade-off between a dynamic array and a linked list? Why would you prefer one over the other? Yeah? Okay, the, the array, dynamic array has random, you know, constant time random access. <coughs> and what about linked lists? Okay, linked lists is, if, as long as you know where you, you are, where the place you want to add something, you can add anywhere in the list in constant time. Whereas with a, an array list, uh, it, can, it can take linear time if you're inserting at the beginning because of all the copying. Yeah? So for the uh, behavior when a dynamic array doubles, and it only happens so often, what's that called? Remember there being a specific term for it? Well, amortized analysis. Amortized. Yeah, that was the kind of analysis we did. Uh, rather than saying the worst case, it's kind of inaccurate to say, it's completely accurate but misleading to say that the worst case, in the worst case, inserting to the end of a dynamic array requires linear time. Right. It does in the worst case, but amortized analysis lets us say, if you do, if you do k consecutive insertions, uh, it'll take time proportional to k. Yeah. What about sets? What's the trade-off between binary search trees and hash tables? Or at least balanced binary search trees. Why would you do one over the other? Yeah. Uh, binary search trees take uh, linear or log time to to search, while hash or hash tables or hash takes uh, constant time. Okay. So you know, again, all the, both these can blow. Oh, well, hash tables can blow up, uh, but in general, you think of hashing is faster. You get constant time hash behavior, regardless of the size of the thing. Uh, with a balanced binary tree, it's going to be log in. So hash tables are faster. Why would you prefer a binary search tree sometimes? Uh, yeah? The ordered traver traversal. Right. You, you, you can traverse, you can obtain the elements in sorted order. So if, you, if there's some ordering you want to preserve, then you want to use a, a balanced binary search tree. Yeah? So if you never wanted order, would it always be better to use a hash table? Uh, Modulo the fact that you, to use a hash table, you've got to have a good way to, you've got to have a good hash function. But to use a binary search tree, you've got to have a good comparison function. I, I, imagine, I can imagine pathological cases where maybe it would be hard to come up with a good hash function. Okay, now we talked about divide and conquer. Here's some of the examples we talked about. Uh, recursive multiplication. Uh, which was disappointingly just n squared, but then carrots of multiplication improved on that. Uh, quick sort divide and conquer, as is merge sort. Quick select is a, you know, based on quick sort, but solves a different problem. That was divide and conquer. Uh, the majority vote algorithms we looked at were divide and conquer. Binary search is divide and conquer, and the earlier algorithms we looked at. Um, we looked at performance. We analyzed performance of binary search of. Um, Divide and conquer algorithms, not by uh, doing summations, but by doing recurrence relations. So the, the recurrence relations in the master theorem are our tools for analyzing the performance of divide and conquer algorithms. And we looked at the utility of blending algorithms, of taking a, uh, it's very often the case that you have a, an algorithm that's asymptotically faster. So carrot suba multiplication is asymptotically faster than grade school multiplication but it only starts to win for very, very large uh, sizes. And we found out we can improve on either algorithm by blending them. By if, the num if your numbers you're multiplying are gigantic, you use the Karatsuba idea. Once you divide and conquer it until the numbers get small enough, you just forget about Karatsuba and just multiply them using grade school. And we saw that divide, figuring that place to do the cutover is just, you just have to do an experiment to figure out at what point do you cut? Yeah. Okay. So he's asking, why is it that Karasuba is faster than grade school for small numbers? No, the other way around. Why is why is grade school faster than Karasuba for small numbers? Okay, what's the reason? Yeah. Right. Karasuba chops these numbers down until they're single bits. 
The base case is you're multiplying two bits. So uh, whereas grade school is going to stop, uh, grade school is working with machine length integers. So it, it doesn't mess around with bits. It's multiplying 32 or 64 bit numbers at a time. So if you think about how many layer, okay, if you've got two 32 bit numbers to, to multiply, grade school does it in one machine operation. Here at SUBA, how deep will the recursion go? Five. 32, 16, 8, 4, 2, 1. So you got all that recursion tree to do that multiplication. Now, even if you uh, souped up Karatsuba to switch over to machine multiplication once the integers got small enough, grade school would still be faster for, you know, for, um, for some numbers bigger than 32 bits, simply because of the overhead of the you know, the, the low order terms, basically. It does, you know, it does extra additions and splits and shifts and, and recursive calls. Yeah? Yeah, well, you should understand its complexity. You should understand, what's the key idea behind carrot soup? What, why is it? That, so we, we came with that recursive multiplication algorithm, which takes two numbers splits them in half and does four multiplications. And then when we applied the master theorem, we realized that it was still n squared. How does Karatsuba improve on this? Yeah. It reduces four multiplications into three by right. taking the sum. Right. It does, it does a clever trick that uh, converts, makes it so you can get by with just doing three multiplications on those halves instead of four. And that's, so that, that key idea, if you don't remember anything else about Karatsuba, that key idea is the thing to remember. Not even so much how the key idea works, just that, you know, with a little bit of algebra, Karatsuba figured out how to do that. And that can be a big deal. It's, it is a big deal to get rid of a recursion, you know, a method call, a recursive call in a divide and conquer algorithm. There was a similar thing where when you do matrix multiplications, for years, people thought it would take n cubed time. So you have two, Ns, two n by n matrices. So you're trying to multiply an n by n matrix by an n by n matrix. And the classical algorithm involves you take this row, this column, do a dot product, that, and you get one number for the new array. And then you, you do this row, the next column, to get another number, this row, the next column. And then once you fill in this row with numbers, you start here. So that's n cubed. n squared dot products, and the dot products take time in. So uh, there's an algorithm called Strassen's algorithm, and he figured out, well, let's think, okay, first of all, he realized that you can multiply matrices by splitting them into quarters and doing eight multiplications of the quarters and reassembling them to get an array. But that still led to an n cubed algorithm. So what do you suppose he figured out how to do? Very similar to what Karatsuba did. This was Strassen, was this guy's name. No, he still divided it into half. So you had four, you know, each, each array was a quarter, uh, it had four quarters. Well, no, he, you know, he made, rec so he would multiply, uh, just, he was just multiplying quarters. But down here, we were doing eight recursive calls to multiply the quarters. He reduced it to seven. So I'm not gonna. I don't I remember offhand what trick he used. It was some, you know, some trick similar to what uh, Karatsuba did. He figured out how to uh, do some manipulations on these quarter matrices so that he could uh, do it in seven recursive calls instead of eight, and that reduced the lower bound from from uh, three to something smaller than three. I mean, n cubed, something smaller than n cubed. Maybe log of eight base seven or something. No, log base eight of seven. Anyway, and that'd be another place where you'd use a blended algorithm. You'd switch over from from Strassen to some to, to sort of the brute force method at some point. And then we already talked about we, uh, you know theoretical limit uh, lower bound on sorting where we used a decision tree. We used decision trees to characterize how many comparisons algorithms do. 
and we're able to come up and prove that any comparison-based sorting algorithm that exists or, has, you know, has, or is yet to be discovered will take order, it will require n log n comparisons in the worst case, at least. So any other questions about this here? All right, we start talking about graphs. And we talked about different types of graphs. So we have directed versus undirected, weighted versus unweighted, sparse versus dense, cyclic versus acyclic. So it's good to have those terms down. We looked at two ways to represent graphs, adjacency matrices, adjacency lists. We know that matrices are good if you have a dense matrix. Otherwise, they're not very good. Uh, depth first search you're interested in for various reasons, not so much to find paths but to find out pre and post times, or to classify edges into back edges and forward edges and such, or to detect cycles. Um, we talked about DAGs. And if you don't remember anything else in the whole semester, just remember that almost always, what's the first step in a DAG algorithm? Topological sort, or linearization, it's a synonym. And we looked at algorithms on DAGs, and we looked at uh, first how to divide an undirected graph into its connected components and then a directed graph into its strongly connected components. So these were all applications of depth first search uh, and, and its key subroutine, which is explore. So you need to be good at looking at a graph and figuring out pre and post times. We know the connected components uh, algorithm. Um, I'm not going to have you. I'm not going to make it so you have to simulate it in your head on the exam. But you should. You should know the basics of that. I mean, yeah, you should know the high, the, the high level details of it, which is you reverse the graph, and then do a depth first search, collecting the post times. For what purpose? When we reverse the graph, why are we collecting the post times? Yeah. Okay. So those post times are just used to, to uh, when we, then we're going to do a depth first search on the original graph to find the components, strongly connected components. And those post times govern how we make arbitrary choices. Where we choose to start each explore is determined by that. So yeah, you need to know the, the high points of the algorithm. Yeah. For undirected graphs? Oh, for, well, for undirected graphs, we don't talk about strongly connected components. Okay. Undirected graphs, we're talking about connected components. Um, because if you go back and forth between two vertices, it becomes even visually easier to find connected components. How do you, just visually, how do you find connected components of an undirected graph? You're just looking for clumps that aren't crossed by edges. Those are the connected components. Um, and the algorithm is simple as well. You just do a single depth first search. And you know, depth first search calls explore. It explores everything you can reach from some vertex. And everything that's reached by that call to explore is a connected component. Then if there are any, any vertices left, you explore from a different vertex and find another component. So it's just a single depth first search. Yeah. Okay, edge classification. Okay, so edge classification applied to a directed graph. And it's not a property of the graph, it's a property of the depth first search that you do. So let's suppose you have. that graph right there, and you do a depth first search starting from here. Okay? So let's say the depth first search first visits here, and then here, and then here, and then it backs out and it does this one. So how do we classify the edges? So we have tree edges, forward edges, 
backwards edges and cross edges. So what are the tree edges? That's the easy one. So. Yeah, the ones I had bolted, the ones you actually used in depth research. Those are the tree edges. Now the ones that are left, the forward edge goes from a vertex to a ancestor of the vertex in the tree. So does this have any forward edges? Well, let's just classify the edges. What's this one here? It's a cross edge. It doesn't go to a, a cross, a back edge would go from a vertex to an ancestor in the tree. This is going to a sibling in the tree. So that's a cross edge. It's going from sibling to sibling or cousin to cousin or whatever. Um, or just two unrelated ones. What is a, a back edge? Right. That would be a back edge because it's going from a grandchild back to the grandparent. If you just look at the, the path in the tree, uh, done by the dark edges. And then I don't have a forward edge here. What would a forward edge look like? Oh, rats, I did the wrong thing. Let's, suppose we have this situation. And suppose you do a depth first search and first it finds this edge and then it finds this edge. That'd be a process, wouldn't it? No, you're right. That's still a cross edge. Construct me a forward edge. Uh, if you okay. if, if you put the fold edge on the left side of the one on the right side, just like the top one first. Yes. Yeah, if the tree went right and then down. Oh, okay, thanks. Then the other edge would go forward. Thank you. Okay, so if we did did the exploration that way, then we have a forward edge. It goes from a node to its grandchild. Vertex to a grandchild. It's just it's sort of an artificial distinction. It's not a property of graphs, it's a property of a breadth of a depth first search. Yeah. So forward edge only applies to an edge that isn't used to find one of the vertexes in the depth first search. Yeah, a, a for a forward edge is similar to a tree edge. The, the difference is they're similar in that they go from ancestor, they go to descendants. It's just that the forward edge wasn't used in the search. It didn't become bold. All right, let's take a break for a couple minutes. I'll get some water and then we'll start up again.
All right, so, so that was depth first search chapter. Any last questions about it? Okay, so linearization, topological sort, two terms for the same thing. So what's your specific question? I didn't quite hear. Like, what's the exact way to think of the order that it determines the linearization? Okay, so when you you linearize a graph, topologically sorted graph, you, first of all, you're talking about DAGs. And so the first vertex in in the order will be a source. The last will be a sink. And if you take any two vertices in the middle, if vertex B occurs after vertex A, what do you know about them? What do you know about the relation between A and B? So let me draw the picture. So you, you've got some graph, and you know here's A source, here's A sink. There may be other sources and sinks, but somewhere in here you have A, and then you have B here. So what does the fact that B follows A in the topological order tell you? Yeah? It means there is not, you're not going to find in the graph an edge from B to A. You won't see that. It doesn't mean there's an edge from A to B necessarily, but it means there is not an edge from B to A. So once you get to B, you have already seen every vertex that has an edge into B. And for some algorithms on telling DAGs, it makes sense to propagate the information from the sources to the sinks. Sometimes it makes sense to go in the opposite direction. Yeah? Are all of the sources going to occur at the very first all of the sinks at the end? Uh, okay, he's asking, are all the sources at the beginning and are all the sinks at the end? Okay. And most people are shaking their head no, and that's right. I mean, suppose you have this. So I should use letters. Hey, there's a DAG. So what could come first? C or A could come first. So let's say A comes first. But then B could come next. And then C could come. And then D could come. So here is a source, and here is a source, and here are the two sinks. So there, all you're guaranteed is that the very first thing has to be a source, and the very last thing has to be a sink. Any other questions? Okay. Then we talked about graph search, which amounted to finding shortest paths in graphs. So first we looked at breadth first search, which is a lot like depth first search, except depth first search uses a stack in the form of the runtime stack of the programming language in which the recursion is being done whereas breadth first search uses a cube. And so you find the shortest path in an unweighted graph. Then we looked at algorithms for finding the shortest paths when there are weights on the edges. And we saw that all three have an update operation in common. Uh, And then Bellman Ford is brute force for any graph without negative cycles. Uh, If you have a DAG, there's an easy way to uh, just apply the update in topological order to each edge. And then uh, Dyson's algorithm was for uh, uh, directed gra- or just graphs without negative cycles, without negative edges at all. Yeah? So would be then Bellman Ford to be said it can do it when there are negative edges? Yeah, Bellman Ford can cope with negative edges. As can the as can the DAG algorithm. So Bellman Ford is, is the most general of them. Yeah. For the update operation, could you go over problem 24 for a minute here? Okay. What am I doing here? Um, okay. Let me read it. Okay. 
okay. Problem is you got to look at graph y up there. Um, okay, so we know that the distance of E is zero, and then we update the edges in that order: B A, E B, B A, D G, and E D. So uh, can I get this all? I can't. You'll have to tell me what order to do the updates in. So let's make a table here. Okay, and I, I said E was zero, is that what I said? Yeah. And we'll assume the ones that are blank are infinite. So uh, what edge do we update first? B to A. B to A? Okay, so what happens there? The, the, the distance that, the best distance we know to vertex A right now is infinite. Right? So uh, if we found a better way. Well, what's the best distance we know to be? Well, currently, the, we know that we can get, basically, we're finding a shortest, the shortest path from E. We start by knowing that it's zero from E to itself. Okay? Uh, the update operation will examine this edge and say, okay, right now it, it's infinitely far from E to A. Let's see if I can find a better way going via B. Well, it's infinitely far to B, plus 6 is still infinite, so that's not an improvement. So it'll stay infinite. Okay, what's the next edge? E to B. Okay, then we update E to B. Well, there we win. Because right now we know that the best answer we have for distance is infinite, but uh, we know E has 0 plus th 3 to get from E to B. That's, that's less than infinite, and so B becomes 3. So you see the game we're playing, we're just what uh, we're comparing the current distance to V and the current distance to U plus the weight of the edge that we're considering. So that's how we update the edge UV. Basically take the smaller of those two things. So what comes next? Okay, now we update BA again. We get a different answer this time. Why? Now B has a 3. So that 3 from this table plus this 6 right here is 9. That's better than infinite. So A gets a 9. What comes next? DG. Okay. DG is another one from where we're, we're inf you know, it's infinite either way, so that's not going to change. The update's not going to do anything if we don't know a better way to get to the, to the U vertex. What's next? ED, okay, that's going to put a uh, 16 here. Now DG again? That's it. Okay. So that's, that's how it works. Yeah? What would we do if it had one of the combinations of like E and C? If? From E to C. Oh, well, you wouldn't update E to C. You, only, you update edges. So what Bellman Ford does is it updates every one of these edges. And if it's lucky, if it updates them in just the right order by luck, it will have found the shortest path to every vertex. And it won't know it until the next iteration when nothing changes. Yeah? With the answer, Phil was asking for the weight of uh, D to G, even though we never updated it finally, um, where G would still, would we answer that G is currently infinite or is the product? I call it, well, the problem said call it infinite, so yeah, it would be infinite if we stopped right now. Yes? Uh, so why is Bellman Ford D cubed again? It's a true force for the... Why is Bellman Ford what? Why is it D cubed? Okay. Place? So the question is why is Bellman Ford V cubed? Well, it's V cubed on a dense graph. Right. Okay? So let, let's just analyze it. So, what do you have to do each iteration? You have to update all the edges. Okay? So it's going to take v squared effort just to get the edges out of the... Let's assume we're using a JC matrix. Well, we don't have to assume that. So, it'll, wh whatever the cost of nearing the edges, plus, we've got to do an update for each edge. 
So that's one iteration. You find all the edges, you update each one. And then in the worst case, how many times do we have to do this? V minus one times. We'll call that V. So it's EV plus the cost of enumerating. So if it's a dense graph, it's going to be EV plus V squared. But if it's a dense graph, E is V squared, and that's V cubed. So in a dense graph, it's V cubed. This EV becomes V cubed on a dense graph. On a sparse graph, it's going to be, enumerating is going to be O plus E, I mean, I'm sorry, V plus E for the enumeration plus E times V. So if it's sparse, it's a little cheaper. Basically, all the edges have to be updated each pass, and there can be V minus 1 passes. Any other questions? Yeah? Should we have to memorize a uh, sparse and dense graph uh, complexities like this? Well, you, you, I, don't, I don't memorize them. I just read or write them when I need to. But the thing to realize is that if you're talking a sparse graph, if you talk about a dense graph, what do you assume about E? Right. It's just V squared. So you, anywhere you have an E in a complexity, you substitute V squared for it. And if it's um, sparse, you, you treat E as if it's the same as V. Any other questions? Yeah. So why is the result of these dices when we have many dices? OK. When we analyzed the complexity of Dijkstra's algorithm, we saw that because there are no negative edges, once a vertex comes off the priority queue, it never goes back on. Okay, and, our, and that meant that we only had to update every edge once. If you, add neg if you have negative edges, it's possible for, you, you can use the algorithm, but when a vertex comes off, it may have to go back on the queue. Because you might, it might be a negative edge you didn't see from somewhere that, that comes in and make, finds a shorter path. And uh, you can then construct a graph that requires exponential time for Dijkstra's algorithm to run. So it's not that Dijkstra's algorithm gets it wrong. It's just that it becomes extremely inefficient in the worst case. So you, you wouldn't want to have, you know, exponential is a lot worse than what you're going to get with Bell and Ford. Can yeah. Say, oh, you go ahead. Uh, can you say exponential when uh, negative, negative edges just lead to like an infinite, you know, search through that? Yeah, it's not infinite because I'm, there's sti you st I'm still ruling out negative cycles. But you could construct a graph with negative edges that would take Dijkstra's algorithm exponential time. So it wouldn't get stuck in an infinite cycle? No, still not an infinite cycle. What if it gets smaller every time around the cycle? Oh, okay. If, it, if there are infinite cycles, then Dijkstra's algorithm won't terminate. I thought that was the, the danger of having a negative cycle in a, in a depth. <laughs> Well, if you allow negative cycles and you, and you define the problem as I want to find the shortest path from a start vertex to every other vertex, the, the longest, I want to find the shortest simple path. The simple path is one that doesn't follow a cycle. Okay? So that, that's the problem we're typically solving with the shortest path problem. We're trying to find the shortest simple path from here to there. If there are negative cycles, there's no known algorithm that's better than exponential. Okay? And in particular, Dijkstra's algorithm would, would just run forever in the presence of negative cycles. So we tend to assume there aren't negative cycles. In the presence of negative edges, even without cycles, Dijkstra's algorithm becomes exponential. Whereas Bellman Ford stays polynomial. You had a question? Yeah. So um, in a dense graph, <coughs> Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, no. A, a dense graph is one that has uh, omega of v squared edges. A, a, a com, you know, a complete a complete graph, I guess, is one where there's an edge from every vertex to every other one. You can have some missing edges and still be dense. So that v squared is like an upper bound of the amount of edges in the dense graph. Yeah. But actually, when when we say sparse, when we say dense, what we're meaning is that E is omega of v squared. It could be a quarter of v squared, an eighth v squared, whatever. And when it's sparse, what we mean is that E is O of V. It's 
no bigger than V in the case of spar. It's no big, it grows no faster than V in the case of sparse. It grows no more slowly than V squared in the case of dense. Other questions? Yep. Well, this is in a sparse graph. Okay, so in a sparse graph, yeah, you could have you could have v be ten, and e be thirty. You know, if 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 e is just three v, e is still o of v in that case. I'm not saying that there's more vertices and edges. I'm just saying that the number <coughs> of edges is proportional to the number of vertices or small. Yeah. You're saying that you have another midterm we could look at? Yeah. Are you going to tell us that? Yeah. I'm going to talk about it if I have time. So don't get up and leave yet. Any other questions? All right. So the last thing on these slides here, that's graph search. Then just a little bit of modular arithmetic. You know, you need to know what modular multiplication and addition are, and those di those distribute the um, simplification rules we talked about. Yeah. So back to the graphs. What would we need to know about graphs in the wild and graphs? Uh, you 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 can know that it's extremely difficult to make up an exam question about graphs in the wild, <laughs> <laughs> because that just refers to when you when you. Uh, when you're writing a program, it's not, no one's going to typically tell you, oh, this is a good place to use a graph. You have to figure that out. Oh, this is a graph problem. And once you figure out it's a graph problem, you've got to figure out, oh, do I really want to explicitly represent the graph or just generate it as I use it? Yeah? For the modular arithmetic on number two, mm -hmm. Okay, so that's up near the top, isn't it? Right there. Okay, so what's the uh, what's the trick here for number uh, for the third one there? Yeah. Uh, so we know that the, the number that we're uh, next to the sign is one more than. Okay. So we're seeing that the the base of the exponential here is one less than this mod. And you know, we have a rule that says you can simplify this by taking this thing here, mod that. So what's that going to be if we take that mod? Um, yes, yeah, that, that's going to be negative 1 in that case. Hey, Joe, quick question. So uh, Jake and I are having this discussion. Uh, it makes sense what we're doing by taking like the complement and raising it to the same power. In this case, it's negative one. Mm -hmm. But that number on the left modded by the number on the right, which is just one more, is that same number. Okay, so you know, let's think about it with smaller numbers. If we take seven mod eight, typically we want to say that's seven, right? Yeah. That's sort of the normal form. But what else is it equal to? It's equal to negative one. It's equal to negative nine. It's equal to 15 is equal to 23. It's equal to all those numbers that differ by 8. It just turns out that the simplest one to work with is negative 1 right here. Because if we plug in negative 1 for this, then we can see. You raise negative 1 to an even power, you get 1 back. Now, what if this number instead had been a 2? Then when we apply our trick, we take that number mod that, we get a 1 here, and we get the same answer. You said Java, the Java and C Sharp uh, with, their, with their mod operations do, uh, they use negative 1 actually? In I think, this is my recollection about Java and C Sharp. If you take, let's say you want to do negative 7 mod 3, what's the answer? Let's see, we add 3, we add 3, we add 9 to it, we get 2. Okay. What I believe that 
these languages do, if they want to take negative 7 mod 3, what they do is they take the negative of 7 mod 3, which is going to be negative 1. Okay, so they, I guess it's not that they're doing it wrong, they just don't give it back in, in the range you expect yet. Because it is negative 1. I would like to, typically you want to see the answer is two. Yeah. Okay, so uh, just for clarity, if we were to begin the question with that, you would rather the answer be two than negative one. Yeah, typically, in fact, in this one I said, it must be a non-negative event less than the modulus. Okay, was there another one you had a question about here? Okay, so here, you know, the trick here is there's a 48 and you have to recognize that 7 squared is 49. Okay? So you can rewrite this thing as 7 squared raised to some even power times 7. Okay? I want to divide the exponent by 2, but it's odd. So I've got a 7 left over. So it's 7 squared is some even exponent times, uh, times 7. Now I take the mod 48. This mess just goes away, right? Because it's, this is going to be 7 squared mod 48 is 1. So we get 1 to some giant power that goes to 1. We just left with 7 mod 48, which is where the 7 comes from. OK. Well, you've had lots of questions, and so I didn't get to this other one. But let me, I just want to say something about it, and then we'll go. This is the midterm from last year. Um, and last year, the one I gave you, the one from 2017, had 25 questions, because I kind of like 25 questions worth four points. Um, I realized that was too many questions to be asking on a midterm. Works on the final, but maybe time, uh, I think the previous year it just took the students too long to do. So I, I, on this exam, I cut back on the number of questions. But I, uh, so the questions are worth more points. I like, I like it when the questions aren't worth many points because then you don't lose a lot of points for a single mistake. But if there's not a lot of time, what can you do? So you'll see the structure is similar. Uh, you know, it's got, you know, my exams always start with a question like that where you've got to figure out what algorithm it is based on doubling behavior. And there's, there's your modular arithmetic question. Uh, there's a summation type question. You can see I'm in a rut, <laughs> right? If you compare this to the other, you, you will definitely see that I started from the 2017 exam and made changes to it to get the 2018 exam. And I'm doing the same thing. So you'll see some types of questions on the new exams that aren't on here, but you'll also see some that are quite similar. Anyway, I'll, I'll, I don't know if I've made this public yet. I'll do that, and you can uh, take a look at it. Talk about it on. Caddis if you want to.